WSYP St. Kofa Radio 95.1 FM in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm a professor through Africana Studies. But today we want to give you just a, uh, just a little bit of insight of the images. And there's always much to share, but we figured we would go live today so that you would have um, some insight about the, the work and research in the field that I've been doing now since uh, 2007 in an unswerving focus on learning about ancient Kush. There's also, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about Kush, but very few really have the knowledge and details of Kush because it really requires going directly to the, to the sites, to the sources, doing original uh, primary research. And there's, uh, there's nothing more important than going to the actual records themselves because, uh, you know, documentation beats conversation. People can talk all day, but when we look at the depth and the significance of, of uh, classical Africa, we must go to the most ancient of these advanced civilizations, which is ancient Kush. So I'm gonna give uh, some insight, some perspective from my work in, in nearly two dozen countries, but mainly looking at the Nile Valley, and we have to look at the origins and the source of uh, ancient Kush. So we'll uh, show some slides of some images and uh, we'll, we'll open it up today. We'll open it up for people to ask questions and um, and to chime in as well. So uh, you know when I'm doing uh, live seminars, we go into to great detail, and even when I'm doing classes. So uh, I'll present quite a lot from my my latest book, A History of uh, of African Civilizations. And it's a course that I teach at uh, Contra Costa College here in uh, in Northern California. But the work on Kush is yet to be completed. There's been scholars over the years and uh, actually over the, the uh, generations that have been looking for the origins of Kush or what the, the foreigners, the Greeks later called Ethiopia. And there's been many scholars in pursuit of this, this high level classical African civilization. And this is what drove me to go directly to the field to look at those, those uh, artifacts at different pyramid sites, temple sites, tomb sites, ancient residential sites in pursuit of the advanced civilization of ancient Kush. And when I learned about this uh, civilization some uh, decades ago, I was quite stunned by reading some of the works like Ethiopia and the missing link to African history, books like uh, uh, the, the African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality, books like The Destruction of Black Civilization. And you know, many, many authors, African authors, black authors who've done the work and research and, but it's nothing more important than, than field work, than primary work uh, in the field and going to the archives and making direct translation and, uh, and interpretation. So that's what we're going to do on, on, this, um, on this particular program or segment of Africana studies. And so, you know, when we're talking about classical Africa, we're talking about not just, we don't just call it ancient, we call it classical African civilizations, because the word classical means the highest rank, the highest value, the highest class, anything that has permanent and lasting value. It's the prototype, the model, the guide by which everything else is judged. That's why we call them classical African civilizations. And it doesn't matter, as I've said before, that in Western uh, colleges and universities, they have these classics departments. These classics departments are a misrepresentation of historical fact. Because in one institution after another, it doesn't matter what the institution is from Stanford to, to, uh, to UC Berkeley to Oxford, it doesn't really matter. They all are the same. And when they look at, uh, and they have these classics departments, they only focus on Greece and Rome, Europe, and leave everybody else out in the world. So it's a misrepresentation of historical uh, and world facts to just have a classics department and focus exclusively on Europe and leave every bit, everybody else out. There's, there's classical civilizations around the world, but students are sold a bill of goods. They're misled, misdirected. They think they're getting some great high level um, uh, education when in fact they're being greatly misled to think that somehow Greece and Rome, can you imagine two societies based on slavery, based on the systematic exploitation of labor Two societies based on the denigration of women, and yet these are supposedly some advanced high-level cultures. 
when nothing could be further from the truth. But this is what the students are saddled with and the public is saddled with today is they've been sold a bill of goods and they matric uh, uh, matriculate in institutions that badly distort the history of the world. How do you leave out classical African civilizations like ancient Kush and Nubia and Kemet? How do you leave out Aksum? How do you leave out other powerful African civilizations in the, in the Congo region? How do you leave out the kingdom of Buganda in Uganda? How do you leave out uh, Great Zimbabwe or Ghana or Mali or Songhai or any of these cultures? You name them. How are they left out? They're left out through the gross misrepresentation of history. So there's no way that any institution can be considered legitimate or have a, a, uh, um, a legitimate program or department in classics and focus exclusively on Greece and Rome and only include other cultures just to try to find out what Homer was referring to or what Herodotus might be uh, referring to in some of his writings. So this is what we've discussed as a foundation. So let's look, take a look at the civilization of Kush. And, um, and you know, so let's show you this and um, I'm going to share some slides so you should be able to, to follow along. Now, if you on um, uh, WSYP Sankofa Radio, then you can go to Facebook Live. As we speak, you go to Facebook Live, you can go right to my page, Mainu Ampim, and you can catch us live to see some of the slides. If you're not able to do so right now, then uh, no problem. We'll leave the, the, uh, this broadcast up so you can catch us later, but we'll try to paint word pictures so you can at least see uh, uh, in your mind's eye what we're really focusing on. And so I'm gonna just show some of the slides to introduce the audience to the field of uh, what I call uh, Kushology. Now, um, I don't know anyone who has used the term, so I may have been the one to, to, um, to uh, coin this term Kushology, but nevertheless, uh, for me, it's about looking at the historical significance of ancient Kush and the emerging field of Kushology. So what I've decided to do some years ago is focus on on ancient Kush, the civilization of ancient Kush, and really focus on and pioneer in the field of Kushology because there's gross misrepresentation about ancient Kush and it goes back to, to uh, George Reisner from Boston who began to do research in uh, Egypt and Sudan. And the further he went south, he ran into the unmistakable remnants and uh, artifacts and influence of the powerful Kushites. And the more George Reisner went south, he went not down, but up south. When we're talking about Northeast Africa, uh, you're going uphill. So when he went to the Southern areas, there's no question whatsoever that those builders of the classical civilization of ancient Kush, that these were unmistakable indigenous Africans who originate from the Southern lands, not the North. And so, uh, but, so people who are looking at this, they really haven't looked in detail about the most ancient foundations of Kush. Kush has a very long history, but uh, what people do look at is they look at Kush in its declining stage, it is in its decline, rather than looking at the original origins of Kush. So the field of Kushology really, uh, there's very few who can claim real competence. But when Kush is written about, the history is usually flipped upside down. And that's why there's nothing more crucial than going to do field work. So uh, now I've discussed this in my book, The History of African Civilizations, which I published uh, last year. And um, in the near future, we'll update and expand the book as well. We just put just some information about African civilizations around the continent. But you know, each one of them deserves a, a book by themselves. And when we look at the classical African civilizations in the Nile Valley, Northeast Africa, then there's not just a book, there has to be volumes and volumes. And um, because much of the research that's been presented, at least in the mainstream is highly questionable, highly doubtful, and has little to do with historical facts and little to do with the documented evidence because people are absolutely intent, mainstream people are intent of trying to reduce the significance of Kush because of the fact the Kushites came from the southern region and they were based in modern day uh, Sudan. 
So this is a section in my book on uh, classical uh, African civilizations. And so here's a map that we created a few years ago uh, with the Save Nubia project. And the goal is to save the history and the artifacts and uh, elevate the influence of, of uh, ancient Kush and also Nubia as well. There's no, there's no, you know, there's no modern culture that is as significant and important importance as uh, a Nubian culture. Nubian brothers and sisters and the cultures in in the areas of southern Egypt and northern Sudan. But you see the map here. And um, when I first read the destruction of Black civilization by none other than Chancellor Williams, who did research in 26 countries in Africa and among 105 different language groups in the 1950s, I was inspired by that level of primary research. Dr. Chancellor Williams is the Dean of Scholars. And, um, and so I used his book decades ago as a general map and a guideline to look at his arguments, his themes, and um, his, uh, his research and use that as a, as a roadmap and a guide to, be, to look at different artifacts, different uh, interpretation of historical periods. And one of the things that's significant is that Chancellor Williams created a map of the, what he called the Ethiopian empire. And again, that's the Greek name that he meant in, uh, is, is the Kushite empire and looking at the place of uh, the great civilizations of Nubia and Kemet, or you know it is Egypt in the broader Kushite empire. And so uh, this is the basic premise. And um, so one of my uh, books will be uh, not only the, the field work that I've done in the region and uh, an explosive, unique interpretation, well, not unique interpretation, but a, a uh, expanded interpretation of ancient Kush. So you see the map here is Northeast Africa. So the heartland of Kush is here. This is where they built, they were building monuments for eternity. This is where you find the greatest concentration of monuments. And this is in fact, the area of ancient Kush near the fourth cataract, fifth cataract, this area here. And um, so you got Nubia in the Northern area here near the first cataract. And this is the area of ancient and modern Nubia. But if you go south, you're dealing with Kush and the Kushite. However, George Reisner, knowing nothing about the region, someone who was looking for a white queen and couldn't find one, and he became frustrated. So as Reisner, who went into the area in 1907 and 1932, went in and systematically misrepresented and distorted the history. And uh, a century later, people are still using the, the outrageous timeline and time frames of uh, and the confusion of George Reisner. And um, but they won't admit it publicly if they're a scholar because Reisner is a he was a vicious anti-African racist who distorted the history as anybody can see from his writings. And the further he went south, he was more and more embarrassed that these were black Africans, no question that established the culture. But this would be the heartland of the Kushite uh, builders. And, um, and then in the Southern area, as you go south. So this area here is Kush. So you see the countries, the, the Sudan is the, the heartland, but South Sudan, this is where we have to look for the origins of Kushite civilization, South Sudan, Ethiopia. Um, and you notice the entire region. And in fact, their work and research extends further south. It has to into Northern Kenya and to Uganda. There's no way if, if so, if a person is not doing research in this area, there's no way they can understand or uncover the origins of the Kushite empire. Most of the research has been quite superficial. They only look in the Northern area and not the Southern origins of ancient Kush. This is why I continue to go further and further to the South. Nevertheless, I think it's pretty clear that we can document Kush influence uh, being uh, in the areas of current day, not only Sudan, but South Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, Eritrea, Djibouti, and also across the Red Sea into Yemen and Saudi Arabia. And you can see the inset here to give you an idea of the geographical area. This map would be about 4,000 BCE, 4,000 before the, the common era or about 6,000 years ago. And there's uh, unmistakable evidence of telltale signs of ancient Kush. So when people are translating documents, even when it says Kush, they change it. They'll change it and they'll say Nubia. It doesn't say Nubia. The whole area um, has to be ha has to be rewritten because of the misrepresentation of George Reisner. You got three powerful civilizations: Kush, and then the powerful civilization of Nubia, and then Kemet. Kush in the south, then Nubia, and Kemet to the north. 
So uh, most people, they write it completely different because they're not looking at the origins of Kush. They're not looking for that. All they're looking at is a more modern period, only to um, uh, the 25th dynasty or the 8th century BCE, in order to try to claim that Kush was simply learning from the northern neighbors, uh, you know, which is outrageous. The civilization spread in the same direction as the Nile, from south to north. And it wasn't just north-south migrations. There was also east-west, which we know. But the southern origins is uh, what we can document. So um, as I mentioned, the classical African civilizations, Kush, Nubi, and Kemet. And that's the order in which they arose. So if people want to really look at and look at the chronology accurately, then we must go to the deep south. And there's been a very surface investigation at best to go into the southern areas, going into South Sudan and going into Southern Ethiopia and to Northern Kenya and Uganda. There's very few that have done extensive work in the area that has really enough competency to really put these civilization in proper chronological order. And uh, so this is but what my pursuit has been overall. I mentioned uh, Kush since 2007, but the work in the entire region for the past 30 years, not to go on holiday or vacation or simply lead a, a, a quick tour, but no, extensive ongoing field work, which is very difficult, but it's rewarding. And um, so what happened in the early, uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, you had uh, propagandists that rewrote the history of the world as we explained on other programs. And actually they took the high level civilizations of Africa who had, <clears throat> that had a, a profound impact on the civilizations of the world. And that ancient model was turned upside down to the current Aryan model. So we have an Aryan model that has been dominant now for the past couple hundred years, where you have scholars from the University of Gottingen who began to rewrite the history of the world. And they turned everything upside down. And then suddenly African uh, civilizations and contributions to the world were minimized and ignored. You take a look at the evidence and it's quite clear. People started to promote uh, 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 all kinds of race theory nonsense. And uh, then we had the immaculate conception of Greece, the Greek origin of this, the Greek origin of that, the father of medicine, the father of history, all of this, this nonsense that was created by, by writers masquerading as objective scholars. And this was during the colonial era, the era that this took place, still during the slave trade. So these these writers tried to justify their inhumanity against Africans, and that's when the history was overturned and rewritten. So what we've done now is rewrite the story, turn the story right side up. The origins of Kush are still unknown. It goes back to the Stone Age. Now, as I've said before, nobody should be, be confused. The Stone Age period is a high-level development. We have stone masons that were building for eternity. So never think that Stone Age means lower than or less than or some backward period. So you got to get some uh, the Fred Flintstone uh, idea out of your mind. It's not some some low level people trying to work with stone. We're talking about master builders who were able to build and master every kind of uh, stone, whether it was granite, gray wax, basalt. Uh, alabaster, you name the stone, they were able to master the building in the stone and they were able to have a laser finished. You see a laser finished monument to stunned at that level of precision. Then it, it clearly indicates that they were operating and with such detail when they carved stones and monuments and statues that one can't help to be impressed and stunned because these are not just any old kind of monuments. Many of them are colossal and, and, uh, and huge in size. And yet you're talking about precision. So we don't have a date, we don't have an origin. Just like Chancellor Williams says, the further we go back, it seems to be ready-made. And one thing that should be known, and this is why Kush is uh, misunderstood, not only the misrepresentation and the systematic racism and crazy scholarship of George Weisner, who still controls the discipline. People use his framework by using disrespectful alphabetical letters talking about the A group. And uh, he talked about a B group. Now they saw well, there was no B group, but there's a C group in X. All of these crazy letters, rather than mentioning the centers, uh, the urban centers where the Kushite 
civilization um, ruled from. He had major urban centers, but he didn't use the names of those centers out of disrespect, out of disregard for their significance. And these are just some of the important sites, but it's the first centralized government, first organized state that we have on record. And this has to be known. When people are looking at Kushite artifacts, they're looking at the emergence of Kush much later and not the earliest period of Kush. One thing everyone should know that in every culture, every place, no matter where you're looking uh, at this broadcast today from or, or listening from, I guarantee if there was an archeological expedition, a major archeological um, expedition in your location underneath the roads, the cities, the buildings, the concrete, there are earlier cultures. There's no question whatsoever, but no one's gonna just disrupt modern life in order to learn about the past, but yet, we see the remains of earlier cultures when there's a large high rise building, for example, that's being created. And the further you, the, the higher the, or taller the building, the further down you have to dig. And that's when um, earlier remains are found. You have uh, burial sites, archeological sites, you name it. And, um, and when I'm leading tours, by the way, in the area, I take people to about four different places, four, you count them that what we're walking on, the area we're walking on, the ground, that there's an earlier culture that goes to an era in an era that has to be thousands of years earlier, much, much, much earlier, because it's underneath the current ground. And there's a different kind of stone and construction scheme that uh, was used. They had different ideas because it's a different era altogether. And when people see that they're actually walking on the more modern level because the further you go down, then uh, you're getting to the older and ancient levels. And you can look at the stratigraphy and look at the levels at the bottom. And then you know that this is an earlier era. It happens all the time. And that has not been done in Sudan and other places, not only the archeological work, but the other thing that has not been done in the region is the most extensive oral history project and the most extensive project to observe the ongoing rituals and cultures that still take place today, ceremony, but looking at it from the point of view of these ancient ongoing ceremonies and rituals that take place in these areas that have not been urbanized, they've not, uh, they've not been changed, that people pretty much for the most part still hold on to the tradition even throughout the generations and the centuries and even the millennia, we have, that's why I go to the region. There's still, there's cultural practices that have not changed very much at all. And people still have the same ideas. And we know that by talking to the kings and chiefs and elders and priests and priestesses as they explain the ritual, the ceremony, the paraphernalia. And it reminds us and takes us back to the classical um, period itself. So let me show you uh, some of the slides. And when we look at ancient Kush, there's uh, four main uh, categories of evidence. There's the biblical evidence. So if you, you know, as a researcher, you have to look at all records. You don't just look at one area of evidence. You look at all the evidence like any serious investigator would do. But even if you look at the biblical evidence, chapter 10, which is, um, in chapter 10 of Genesis, it's a table of nations. And we hear about Noah, you know, the same Noah's Ark, that Noah. Noah had three sons of Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And according to theologians and biblical scholars, I know this might sound strange, but you know, for, for those that believe the Bible is the only book you need to read to know history. So for that group and those who interpret it that way, that Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And according to this, interpretation and idea ham represents the progenitor and the ancestors of all people of African descent. And then Japheth is supposed to represent all people of European descent and Shem is the, representing the mixed groups in the world. And that's according to the biblical uh, interpretation. So if you, if you went by that record, then Ham has four sons. Sorry, ladies, they, they don't really focus too much on women in the biblical text. But if you go by that, that source, you notice that Ham himself had four sons, Cush, Egypt, 
and uh, it says put, they mean punt and Canaan. And notice which came first. And look at the order in which these civilizations emerged, Cush, and then uh, it says Mizram, they refer to Egypt, punt, and then Canaan. These are supposed to be the sons of Cush. Remember, Cush is the progenitor, the ancestor of all people of African descent. Then there's records from Kemet, there's archeological evidence and the Greek and Roman records. But this is the uh, the main category to really delve into the details of ancient Kush from the uh, physical record. Now, again, this is just a physical record. Uh, there's nothing that is more important than oral history. Oh yeah, people think, well, oral history could change. People could, could change things around or forget. Well, let me tell you something. There's nothing in the uh, archeological record that is more important than oral history, even though I know people would like to tell us that because when you find an artifact, let's be very clear, the artifact never has instructions about who used it, when, uh, um, um, and when they used it, or how they used it, or none of that. You have to figure that out. And that's why scholars disagree on certain things. You might have a date range, uh, plus or minus so many years. You have uh, uh, disagreement about uh, not only the age, but there's got to be interpretation of of, uh, of how it was used. Sometimes that could be figured out, but uh, the records change. And some archaeologists disagree with another school of archaeology. So it's not set in stone, even though scientific methods could be used. At the same time, there's great variation, there's great opinion. And so any investigator who's serious will look at all of the evidence, including the oral history itself. And uh, if not, then a the person's not serious. Some of the records from Kemet to know about Kush as a journey to Harkov, Hatshepsut, and uh, you name it. There's lots of ar archaeological records everywhere. And the reason why there's uh, ar archaeological evidence because of the theft, the grand theft, not only by Reisner, but other institutions went in and stole artifacts. And now they, they are in museums around the world. This is a general outline, you know, going back in settlements in the region, the uh, region. And um, now, and so uh, this is kind of a general outline just to have a placeholder, but these are only broad ideas, but all we know is that it's hard to even put a date really on, uh, on Kush, but to only consider that the Kushites emerged uh, in the more recent periods, whether they, some people, uh, they'll mention Kerma uh, 1500 or so and try to um, misrepresent that evidence. So they'll talk about the 25th dynasty as the black dynasty or the black pharaohs, sometimes called the Ethiopian or the Kushite dynasty. No, there was Kushite uh, high level kingship long before that, long before that. And anybody who's writing to the contrary, then let's debate the evidence because it's not just quoting people who have an agenda. And their agenda, again, is the further you go south, the more nervous people get. They're looking for a non-Southern origin. Because why is that the case? You go to the southern areas and it's unmistakable, non-debatable uh, uh, evidence of Africans. But then when it's in the north, even though these are also African people, no question, people try to slip in more evidence to try to distort the evidence by bringing in foreign images, foreign ideas, and, uh, and, and they mix and mingle different periods, whether in a straight chronology to show that the foreigners came later. But when you go south, there's no way to do that. You're looking at literally black skin brothers and sisters who uh, who represent a foundation for the entire region. And so, um, you know, mainstream media, let me skip through most of this because uh, they're confused. They don't know the difference between uh, one group or another. They don't know Nubian or Nubia uh, at all. It's mixed up, it's mingled up, but this goes to rising. And then, um, so they mix and mingle Nubia, which is a, a great civilization that goes back into antiquity, but they don't know the difference between any of the cultures at all. So um, let me skip through some of these. Lots of archeological sites that uh, I've gone to repeatedly to, to do careful analysis, assessment and documentation in the, uh, in the region. But again, this is the heartland of Kush in this area. Uh, this is Reisner who I uh, told you about. And, um, but he's the one that classified all of the different historical periods. How in the world in 2020 could people be using a framework to try to understand uh, Kush and Nubia and that whole region by going by someone who was absolutely bent on systematic misrepresentation 
and uh, an outright anti-African racism. He had warped ideas, and yet I tell you that Reisner controls the interpretation. People are not going to ad admit that, but you take a look at Reisner's chronology and then look at what chronology people are using now. It's the same with little variation. You look at the, the, the wording and the, uh, the description of these different periods in Reisner's writings and those today, and it's basically the same. So you know that they're misled by somebody who had an agenda. Um, like for example, you know, you have different titles in the 18th dynasty. So we're talking around, you know, 3600 BCE. We're in the region of, uh, now all of these civilizations must be clear, the Kush, Nubia, Kemet, it's one cultural complex. It's one cultural African complex that was united by the Nile. And people traveled, they traded, they intermarried, they intermixed. And so you have one cultural complex with all kind of overlapping similarity. And this overlapping similarity makes it such that they use common ideas and, and titles and you name it. And, but the distortions become absolutely deliberate. So if you take a look at this here, and, um, and you, you take a look at inscriptions like this, people just call it a vice or really a high level position, but it's Sa uh, Naisu in Kush. Sa Naisu in Kush. So now you take a look at this, this clearly says the king's son of Kush. But then people mistranslate it because they will uh, mislead folks. And like Reisner did, he will say that these are people from Nubia. It says Kush. So there's no, there was never any understanding of ancient Kush from Reisner's work because of his agenda. He knows if he goes further and further south in an area that he doesn't know anything about, the civilization that stunned him, Kush, and then all of the other names. So for him, there's a major issue, a major problem. So what he did to get past the problem, uh, Reisner did, he just mixed and mingled them all together. And that's why, um, the idea of Nubia became uh, became confused because people didn't know where Nubia actually was based on the misrepresentation of um, of George Reisner. This is why we have to go to African pioneers to sort out, like Chancellor Williams, to sort out the geographical locations and regions. So these are all ancient, classical African civilizations going to the southern areas, and then they they spread down north. But that's not what you get with most of the people because very few really have a facility in Christology. And if they're looking at mainstream ideas, mainstream writers, they're going to be misled 100% of the time because people are using the framework of Reisner. And, you know, and Nubia has always been great. Then it's a great culture. Great. That's one of the highlights when, when people travel to the region. They want to go to Nubia, go to the Nubian villages, see the Nubian elders, the Nubian people the Nubian school, the children. And it should be a highlight because of the great culture of people. You know they come from a great tradition because of the, the, uh, the great character that people have and the high level of humanity. I love traveling in the region because of the hospitality, the African brotherhood and familyhood when they're able to, to um, always assist with the field work. And there's no, no place more special than Nubia. So Nubia is set in stone, but Reisner, knew about Nubia because the Nubian culture, it, it continues even though there's been an assault on Nubian language, Nubian culture, Nubian lands through dams. And, and um, so that's been an assault, but Reisner expanded Nubia to a, a, a much larger area in the South because he didn't know anything else. And he was not willing to, to admit that there were other cultures that he didn't know about because he was a black skinned people that clearly uh, confused him. Let me skip through some of these, but this is part of the propaganda here is the so-called black pharaohs it's from uh, Robert Moorcott's book. And to show you the, the confusion, you take a look at the, the title, the black pharaohs, Egypt's Nubian rulers. So he's talking uh, the 25th dynasty, talking about the eighth century. The problem is this, those of you who see this image on the book, this is not a Nubian. This is, this is none other than Taharqa, the, the text only describes him as a Kushite. And he's the greatest builder in the history of Kush. You look up the name Taharqa, the same Taharqa is mentioned in the biblical text. He's the greatest builder in the history of Kush. Everywhere you go up and down the Nile Valley, you see the DNA, the fingerprints of none other than Taharqa, the great builder 
who built in mighty monuments, building large columns, contributing to, to the great temple uh, structures up and down the area, to the Amen Temple and statues and you name it. You have the DNA and the fingerprint of the great builder built building pyramids. It's the great Taharka. And so why call him a black pharaoh anyway? So he's, he's a Kushite from the deep Southern area. And so Taharka comes from the deep South. This is why Reisner and others had problems because there's no way to lie and talk about some mysterious travelers from the North who were supposedly uh, <laughs> some unidentified group that came into Africa from the North to teach Africans uh, what they couldn't uh, teach themselves at home. How, how foreigners are gonna come and start building pyramids for Africans that they couldn't build at home? And so it's been nothing but propaganda. And by the way, there's twice as many pyramids built by Kushites in Sudan than there is in Egypt, twice as many, literally hundreds, twice as many. But this is an image of Tarharka. And he's not Nubian, he's a Kushite. The text says Kush, consistently Kush. And yet he's got the wrong image and wrong title on the, on, on the book. And then National Geographic and many others have weighed in the same way, talking about the black pharaohs. What do you mean, the black pharaohs? This is propaganda. When, when this came out in February 2008, the, the cover of National Geographic, then uh, people were happy. Some people, that is. They say, yay, they finally admit it. Yay, we won. They finally admitted that they're black pharaohs. Hold up, wait up. Don't be so quick. The title is misleading in more than one way. First of all, National Jew got talking about the black pharaohs. Well, why would you say black pharaohs? It's assumed that the pharaohs are black. No one says the, the wet rain. We know by definition that the rain is wet. So why would anybody repeat? It doesn't make any sense. And, and by the way, it's assumed that they're African, that they're black people, just like we assume that the emperors of Rome were white or the rulers in, in Greek were, were, were also white, European. Some were mixed if they were, when they were in Kemet, but we assume that they were, are of European descent. No one talks about the white emperors of Rome. It's assumed, but why the black pharaohs? Because the idea is this, is to make the public think, to make the public think that the first 24 dynasties were not black rulers. And it's only this one period the 25th dynasty, where you have those that came from the very deep south in Sudan, the Kushites, the real black pharaohs emerged in the 25th dynasty. And this is a late period, a later period. And so that's what the idea is, is to make the public think that the first 24 dynasties, there weren't African uh, pharaohs and, and rulers, which is absolutely uh, uh, absurd when the evidence clearly indicates that this is an African civilization from the very root in the foundation and every major period, you have, you have African rulership, no question. So the National Geographic title is misleading, but look at the subtitle. It says the black pharaohs conquerors of ancient Egypt. So the whole article is to do one thing, is to create a, a conflict between the Kushites in the South and the people of Kemet or ancient Egypt in the North. Like these are some, some vastly different groups and then try to make uh, racial distinctions. You got the black pharaohs from Kush in the south, and then you got the non-black pharaohs of Egypt in the north. And uh, this is what the propaganda, this is how the propaganda goes. It's, uh, it's completely made up, it's contrived, it's invented. It's, it's, uh, it's a gross misrepresentation of clear facts. And, uh, and then the article, as is the common theme for all mainstream writers, is to show Kush and anything related to Kush, if it's something extraordinary like building massive pyramids or um, elaborate temple structures or colossal statues, the uh, the statement is always the same that they're imitating. They're imitating in uh, what was uh, presented in Egypt, or they're simply copying, or they're you know they're they're emulating, and that's how it's presented. So so according to these mainstream writers, propaganda, and unfortunately, too many people. Follow, blindly follow their lead as they follow the lead of none other than Reisner. So I break away from that because it has nothing to do with historical facts. It's just twisted. Things are made up, they're invented. And the whole goal is to try to minimize or even eliminate Kush and its Southern origins. And not only that, but the antiquity, the much older period of Kush 
and Nubia before Kemet or Egypt even emerged. You got these civilizations to the south and very few have written about it other than the, as I indicated, it's a long, it's a list of, of great African scholars, Morcott. And so, um, and the Kushite and Nubian exhibits today, they've only come around as a result of the African-centered movement. Black scholars challenged all of the propaganda and only in the 1990s, for the first time ever, there have been permanent Kushite and Nubian uh, collections for the first time, even though the research was done in the early 20th century. But why wait until the 1990s? Why wait a half a century? Because the goal in the different museums was to suppress the significance of ancient Kush. Why put Kushite artifacts on display when people are not discussing it? Let's only deal with Egypt and then lie about that to, to try to make Egypt be somehow people have attempted, and they still try this today, to try to detach Egypt from the African continent. So they detach it from Egypt and, uh, and float it off to the Middle East somewhere and then take African people out of Egypt itself. And that's what's been done. But uh, if you take a look at Kush, so Kush was ignored until the 1990s. Why then? What happened in the early 90s? It was a response to the African Senate movement, to the, to the movement of black scholars that began to raise the uh, profile and the details of these classical African civilizations of Kush and Nubia predating and influencing the, the younger civilization of Kemet or Egypt. And once these scholars began to make an impact in the mid 80s and late 80s, and then by the early 90s, the museums began to respond. They didn't do any new archeological work. There was no new archeological research. They simply one by one took these artifacts from their basements and put them on display all of a sudden. We're talking about uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. We're talking about the uh, Oriental Institute, uh, the Oriental Institute in um, at the University of Chicago. They have a museum there, and they too did the you know same thing. All of a sudden, you got archaeological evidence from decades earlier suddenly put on the on display. You got the Royal Ontario Museum in uh, in, in in Toronto, Canada, the British Museum in uh, in London. Uh, they used to have one at the Smithsonian. But you look at all these institutions and you take a look at when did they create the permanent Kushite uh, exhibits or galleries, the, 19, the early 1990s and later, when all of the research had been done decades and generations earlier. Why not display them if it's really about honest and objective history? Because it was a political motive. And the political motive is that, you know what? Uh, we're going to put these artifacts on display so you black people, you black writers, uh, black public, black scholars, you all can can start looking at Kush and that's the real black pharaohs, but we're gonna keep a stranglehold on ancient Egypt because we're go we've taken it out of Africa and we've taken black people out of Egypt and we're gonna continue to try to dominate this region. So we're not gonna let you battle us on Egypt. So what you need to do black scholars is you need to look to the South, to the black pharaohs who came much later and this is what happened. If someone doesn't know that, you got to look it up and look at the political history of how uh, and why these artifacts were finally put on display. It was to mislead the public. So this is the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. All this stuff was stolen decades and decades ago, where you can see from, you have different coffins and statues, as you can see here, of kings, of rulers, queens, goddesses. Look at the large head here. You got columns from temple environments, and then you have a student with a backpack and uh, others taking notes. But you go to these different collections and you see the um, uh, the different artifacts of different writers, different scholars. Some of the books I mentioned earlier, but Drusilla Dunsey Houston wrote The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire in 1926. And there's a second volume. And uh, then there's John Jackson's important small pamphlet, Ethiopian, the origin of civilization. Remember Ethiopia, they were, that's the Greek word for Kush. Ethiops meaning burnt face, black face, or kissed by the sun. Then there's none other, there's no one more important than William Leo Hansberry in his book, um, his uh, books. Actually, Hansberry is a pioneer. He did work, he did research, he created, as I've mentioned, uh, I believe last week on Africana studies, that it was the great William Leo Hansberry that created the African uh, the African Civilization section of the History Department at Howard University in 1922. And when, and when 
Hansberry created his African civilization sections. He was ridiculed in Howard. Yeah, people did not see African civilizations as a legitimate field. And he was, he was dismissed by even his own colleagues. But he taught people like uh, Chancellor Williams and um, Joseph Harris. And it was Joseph Harris who took the William Leo Hansberry lecture notes and his uh, field notes and created the William Leo Hansberry African History Notebook 1 and 2. And volume 2, very significant, Africa and Africans as seen by so-called classical writers. So again, he's referring to Greek and Roman writers, but classical writers. So Joseph Harris collected the work of his teacher, William Leo Hansberry, to talk about ancient Kush. This is Drusilla Dungey Houston in her work, um, very significant, by one and two. Again, now she wrote in 1926, so this is almost a century ago. People have been talking about Kush, and she argues that the Kushite civilization not only extended across the Red Sea, but also into, uh, into as, as far east as India. That's her argument. I know that definitely crossed the Red Sea, no question, Yemen and Saudi Arabia, those areas, she believes extends even to uh, India. And it's a great argument, great thesis. And um, what Lucilla Houston was talking about, here's a quote from her book. She says, there seems to be a worldwide conspiracy in literature to conceal the facts that this book unfolds because of this suppression of truth, world crimes have been easily made possible against the Ethiopians. When she says Ethiopian, she means black people, Africans. That was the term that was used. People often use uh, Ethiopian because of the power of, of uh, Ethiopia or ancient Kush. People still were using that in the, 20, the early part of the 20th century, Ethiopian meaning black people. World crimes, you know, and there's domestic crimes that continue to, to take place because people have tried to define African people as less than human, making no contributions to the world which has opened up this, uh, this uh, possibility of more crimes. And yet people, it's the opposite that's true. Not only have African people made great contributions, but we're at the pinnacle of human achievement, at the apex of human achievement when there was nothing happening in Europe, nothing, no developments at all. And this is what she's referring to in her book. She also talks about the significance of Kush on many other pages. That's what her books focus on. She says this, the chapters of this book, proved the Kushite race to have been the fountainhead of civilization. If you desire truth, if you desire to be fair-minded, to be educated in the vital knowledge not possessed by the average college student, if you desire to be an authority upon the life of the ancients, go down with me in our, as archaeology, ethnology, geology, and philology disclose. That's the Scylla Dunja Houston challenging people. And she says she has an arsenal of facts that Harvard or Yale or scholarly or, or cowardly scholarship in our own race dare not refute. And she's challenging people. How can there be leadership when people are ignorant of the past? So my work over the decades has been to help African people and the public at large recover from historical amnesia. They've forgotten about the great significance of Africa. This, the, the, this is uh, none other than John Jackson. His, important pamphlet because they are focusing on Kush or what the Greeks later called Ethiopia. There's, there's the William Leo Hansberry called the father of African studies because of his pioneering work um, in uh, looking at the origins of ancient Kush. All of the Greek writers are consistently talking about Ethiopia, they mean Kush. And by the way, if you're trying to figure out, well, how did Kush become Ethiopia? Uh, if you're listening, I have on the screen so, you know, the, the, the Hebrew Bible, when it was translated into Greek, about 200 BCE, the Hebrew Kush, which could be with a K or a C or Kushite, um, it became Ethiopia or Ethiopian with an A in front. And then, um, so that's, the, that's, that's, that's what happened when it, when it was translated into Greek. The Kush became to the Greeks, Ethiopia or Ethiopian, and later in the English version, the King James version, they dropped the A and it simply became Ethiopia or Ethiopian as we know it today, a man with sunburnt or black skin or, uh, or black face. And this is part of the linguistic work of William Leo Hansberry. But that's where we get the term Ethiopia. So the, it's not an African word at all. It's a Greek word because they were struck by the, people, the people's color. And you go to the region, there's people with all kinds of very shades of brown and also jet black in color, literally. And uh, people were stunned by that. So it's an extensive empire. The Greeks, they wrote about this. 
that the Kushite Empire, by the way, to the south of Greek, uh, of Greece, you have Ethiopia on, on the African, and then what they call the Asian side. They're referring to the eastern side of the Red Sea. And this had always been, uh, according to Strabo, the writer uh, Strabo, this has been always been the opinion of the Greeks. And, uh, and then he also indicates that, that this civilization extends into India. So this is uh, part of the uh, argument of uh, Drusilla Houston, as I had mentioned earlier. And the Greeks had the highest respect for the Kushites. There's nothing negative ever said. The first writer in the history of uh, Europe is none other than Homer. He wrote the, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey about 800 or so BCE. He said, I tell you, Zeus left to join the blameless Ethiopians at a, blank, at a banquet and all the gods went with him. But in 12 days time, he will be back on Mount Olympus. Here it is, according to Homer, he's talking about the king of the gods, uh, in Greek culture, Zeus, and Zeus had to leave his area on Mount Olympus with other gods, and they had to go to a to a banquet of the Ethiopians for 12 days. So think about who's the authority here. The authority are the Ethiopians, because if they if uh, if Zeus was the authority here, then the people would be coming to him. The king or the ruler or the god doesn't go to somebody else. He's going to the, notice what he calls them, the blameless Ethiopians because they're blameless in matters of conduct. And this is the great tradition of the, the people of ancient Kush, having great character, having a high level civilization that took care of people where there was no hunger and no poverty. They didn't go out going to war against people. They had the utmost respect from countries around them. Very powerful, but humble at the same time. Always presented in a respectful manner by Homer and all of the other foreigner writers, the blameless Ethiopians, meaning they're blameless in matters of conduct. So anyway, even Herodotus, and think about this, Herodotus, the Greek writer, the Greek historian, says this, the Ethiopians are, the, are, are said to be the tallest and best looking people in the world. Now remember, it's not Ethiopia as we know of as a country today, but we're talking about the region that I had shared with you earlier. Most people consider themselves to be the best looking. The Greeks did not. They thought that the Ethiopians were the best. Look. And, and by the way, who are the tallest people in the world? The Dinka. In measurements, the Dinka, who are based in, uh, in, uh, in South Sudan. They are, as a group, the tallest people in the world. So uh, that's the area that they're referring to. So you go to the southern areas to learn about Kush and all of the contributions that the Greeks give to the people of Kush, or so-called Ethiopia. Notice that Lucius said were the first to invent the science of the stars and gave names to the planets. So he's indicating what can be documented is that you got astrology beginning in the southern area. You got astronomy or the science uh, of giving names to the planets. The astronomy being uh, credited to the great Kushites and that they also passed on this knowledge uh, to the northern Africans and Kemet. This is what the Greeks consistently described as a high level civilization of Kush that they called Ethiopia. Now you're listening to WSYP, San Colfer Radio 95.1 FM in Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm the professor. Uh, and you're listening to Africana Studies with Professor Mainu M. Pim. And on this uh, program, we're actually looking at and um, showing you slides. We're on Facebook Live as well. And we're showing you slides as I'm giving a basic foundation of ancient Kush, the classical African civilization of ancient Kush. And uh, that's what our focus is. The last couple programs, we were focusing on classical African civilizations and their significance and why this field of study has been relegated to, to um, optional study or now taken out of college catalogs, taken off the agenda with high schools across the country. And now very few people know about ancient Kush, but in the heyday of, um, of the black power movement and the black studies movement and uh, on college campuses, you had people learning about classical Africa, but, but now there's very little study on African civilizations as we are in the early 20th century, even the odorous saying that all of the, that the, the God, that, that honoring the gods and sacrifices and uh, processions and, and festivals that these all these rites they are from Kush or what they again called Ethiopia 
And then, uh, so it's consistently the Cushites are given credit. So it doesn't matter what source you're looking at. Here's Chancellor Williams, the author of Destruction of Black Civilizations is a map he had put together that I was mentioning earlier, the vast Cushite empire, which we drew uh, some guidance from to create our map about ancient uh, Kush that we share with you uh, based on field work. It's not just copying Chancellor Williams, but it's to look at the field work and the evidence from not only in the field, but art, but uh, in museums and institutes, libraries, and doing a lot of lot of study uh, in those areas as well. And Chancellor Williams is correct. He says that, but the greatest of all issues is right here in the general agreement that, that at the very earliest period known to mankind, an African civilization um, in the areas later called the Sudan and Egypt war was fully developed with all the arts of civilized life already matured. Its beginnings being placed so far back into the early history of the world that it is beyond the reach of man. In other words, the further we go back, we see a ready-made high-level civilization based in Sudan and Egypt, and very few have done the hard field work to be able to learn about the real antiquity of Kush. So let me skip through some of these and show you some, some slides. Um, but we see different images of people from Kush. These are Kushite princes. You um, have a lot of different images. And what's striking about the images when you see black and brown, this is exactly how people look today in the region, indigenous people. We're not talking about people that came in early. These are people that are indigenous to the region. And these are none other. The text clearly indicates that these are Kushites. Notice the, the beautiful, uh, um, jewelry that they wear, the almond-shaped eyes. There's a crown on their head indicating their high-level status. The white linen dress and the, the bracelets on their arm, beautiful sandals. Notice the collars. Uh, these are Kushites. This is a high-level, highly advanced, highly sophisticated civilization that's been minimized for the past century because of the, the significance that people actually knew and admitted the high level culture of ancient Kush comes from the Southern area. In other words, it's from, even though the heartland of ancient Kush is modern day Sudan, you have gotta go to the South to look at South Sudan and the great cultures there and people in the region of Southern Ethiopia, people speaking today, Kushite languages. We'll look at that next week. Uh, some of the field work I've done among these groups, spending time in the villages, in the, in the areas that have not been changed uh, a whole lot at all. And there's a similar ritual, similar ceremony. You see this beautiful image here, and there's, um, you have a servant bringing rings of gold. Anytime you see three, it means plural, lots of gold. And this is the symbol, uh, Nebu, meaning gold. So it's a reason today that people literally, you know, before, you know, the political upheaval, there's uh, all kinds of people searching for gold in Sudan. And so uh, the monuments and statues, colossal images, uh, they're everywhere. And yet there's not, and it, can you imagine, you got massive statues, you 30, 40 foot high um, images and columns and temples and pyramids in Sudan is still, even now, not a tourist location. You can go to the places and, and see and barely see people in the area even now with uh, some of the most significant artifacts anywhere in the world. And yet you really don't see tourists. It's not a tourist infrastructure set up. This is one reason why people don't know more about Kush because you have to have the infrastructure set up. So Egypt has an infrastructure for tourism, you know? And so, um, um, you know, before the Arab Spring and the uprising, you know, tourism was at an all time high in Egypt where the whole infrastructure is set up largely for tourists. You know, you have uh, archeological sites that are set up and roads and guides and hotels and restaurants and everything set up. You know, you have tour companies that set up to bring in tourists. Sudan is not like that. When you're in Sudan, you got great artifacts, but the infrastructure is not set up. Here I'm standing right underneath a powerful statue of a Kushite ruler. 
Look at the precision. This is made up from granite. These were master builders in the entire region. And they, you know, there's a lot of cultural interchange because it's one region. The borders that we know of today, those borders weren't the same and uh, not at all. You know, you've always had political borders when you're dealing with political states. However, uh, these borders were not, at, they weren't rigid where there weren't some fluidity in terms of trade and travel and, um, and uh, family intermixture. You had that as well. And look at the cultural interchange in terms of names and even pottery. Someone asked in a class I was teaching a few days ago about pottery. It's an excellent question because you take a look at the pottery and the black top pottery, the pottery with the black top in the region is very similar from Kush, Nubi, and Kemet. You flip a coin to try to figure out it's from what culture it represents. There's one united complex. You have to be a pot shard specialist to try to figure out which culture this pot, these pot fragments belong to and then what time period because they're absolutely similar. And what's interesting is that pot, pottery is what distinguishes one thing that distinguishes one culture from another, but yet lots of similarities. There are other images of Kushites, Kushite rulers, uh, very powerful, and they weren't imitating anybody. They had their own distinctive culture. Their own, um, they have a distinctive crown as well. If you look at the details of the Kushite uh, crowns, we showed you, uh, take a look, you know, some of the crowns that have two cobras, not one. Now, if you all, you know, there's one cobra on the uh, crown right there at the forehead. In Kemet or Egypt, there's one. Kushite, you see two. That's one of the distinctive Kushite features, you know, with the double uh, cobra, the uraei, and then notice as well the the uh, ram's ears, the horns horns of a ram representing Amun, or you know that the name is Amun. Amun is a name that was respected throughout the region. So when Christians and Muslims say Amen, then that's what they're referring to. But you see these, and these are, there's no reason to be calling them black pharaohs. These are African rulers, just like the other ones are African rulers. There's no distinct period where suddenly there's black pharaohs that come out of nowhere. No, they're all are black, they're all are African. And, um, and here's the great Taharqa that we showed earlier and uh, all kind of great uh, builders. And so um, I'm gonna skip through some of these, but it's interesting when you look at the Kushites and notice the, there's a um, distinctive Kushite headdress there's uh, also artifacts like you see here. Here's a coronation of the King Astelta. And uh, this actually, you know, when you take a look at the artifacts and take a look at their coronation stela, these stones, is really like an autobi uh, 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 autobiography that you have all this text that explains what the person accomplished. And here's the Kushite King Astelta and here it is, he is receiving his crown by Amun and Mut. He's receiving his crown of rulership and notice he, he kneels down out of respect. He's humbled as he received his crown during the coronation ceremony and then his mother has to preside over the ceremony. Always the mother, this is the Kushite tradition. The mothers are the ones that, that bestow kingship because uh, the kingship was traced through the female line. So as felt to, to Harker, you name it, it's the mother presiding over the ceremony. And that's what gave them their kingship. That's important. You got, look at the beautiful jewelry of the Kushites. Uh, Het Haru uh, indicated here. Notice the beautiful jewelry. She's sitting on the throne and a staff of authority with the image of an unk, meaning the eternal life. Beautiful artifacts, uh, ancient Kushite, um, all kind of metals. This looks like the origins of the modern tweezers, different items, stone, alabaster, metal. Uh, Kush was very, very high level and their craftsmanship made that absolutely very clear. High level, beautiful craftsmanship. And um, notice also there's other Kushite artifacts, daily life uh, items such as a bed made out of wood, and if you take a look at the items, you know it goes back to the early Kushite period because not only is it well made, but it's the, the uh, bed 
indicates their closeness to nature. Well, what do you mean, Professor Maynou? What closeness to nature? Take, if you take a look at the bed, not only is it well made, uh, but you have um, pictures of animals near what would be the headboard, but the legs of the bed in with the hooves of a cow. And you always see that hooves of a cow or lion claws. Why would they do that? Because they're close to nature and they're close to the animals and their environment. They were able to live in harmony with their environment versus how the West lives. The West will kill anything moving in order to have concrete, uh, concrete and, and, and buildings. This is what, how, how they do things. But you see people are able to use nature and be close to nature. Here are rings made out of gold. And even here, you see the cobra and uh, the vulture, even on rings worn by kings. And let me skip some of these. Here's some of the black top pottery, um, distinctive to the region. Notice the ram horns. There are all kinds of different uh, uh, items, bowls, cups, you name it, uh, vessels for liquid. So this is common to the region. And the black top pottery, you find it everywhere up and down the Nile Valley. Notice the beautiful images. Here you have jugs and you have giraffes, different elements uh, of plants. And this is part of the Kushite culture, Kushite uh, artifacts. And so this is antiquity. This goes back to the early Kushite period, but there's a period much older. So what we'll look at is a series of, of, uh, of, of programs on ancient Kush today I'm simply giving you images to let you know that these images are impactful, they're powerful, they're important, and but we'll look at other elements as well of the classical civilization of ancient Kush, and then show you the modern rituals that still take place, the modern ceremonies that still take place, modern images that are used that are very, very similar to the distant past of ancient Kush, so you can see some of the some of the field work that I continue to do. And then you have different pyramid sites at El Kuru. Can you imagine that people don't even go to these areas? It's not even a tourist site. You, you don't even have uh, security in a lot of these areas. This is how much the, um, the, the ancient Kushite contributions and civilization uh, and the artifacts that remain have been reduced in importance where you don't have a flood of people going to an area with, with uh, hundreds of pyramids, at least 223. Some are saying that they found some new pyramid sites. I'm not totally convinced of all that, but we'll see, and we'll come up with a new count. But nevertheless, you got different pyramid sites in Sudan um, and beautiful images as well. It's a very high level, sophisticated culture in the field of Kushology. It has to be further. It has to be, you know, further advanced. Let me skip through some of these, but you know, men and kings and rulers are often focusing on their mother. They're, uh, you know, if they're going to mention a parent, it's going to be the mother. This is why we don't always know the the genealogy because they don't always put emphasis on the father, but they do on the mother. Here is uh, um, Kalhata. She's in the middle. Uh, in her her tomb area, but beautiful Kushite images. You find them everywhere, very high level, very sophisticated. And this is just one era. There's earlier eras, even beyond, you know, a couple thousand years ago. There's also the pyramids of Nuri. And again, very few people go to the pyramid sites, site of Nuri. We have uh, dozens of pyramids built for kings and queens and high uh, officials. You know, and uh, but very, very few people going to Nuri. When I go to these areas, you can you can always count the number of people that are there, and you can be there all day and really not even see people. But this is uh, this is really sad that people don't know that one of the greatest cultural complex in the history of humanity, and yet people don't even go and they don't know. And okay, you might find camel, but you don't have people, I'm showing a camel train that might be going through the area, but not uh, too many tourists. So this is why people don't know. And because people don't know, distortions are possible and they are prominent. So this is why 
pioneering in the field of Kushology is one of the the uh, areas of focus for me. There's a great pyramid site of Jebel Barkel, a sacred site, sacred mountain. There's pyramids in the area. These are distinct Kushite pyramids, you know, distinctive angles, and uh, they're not copying anybody. This is one cultural complex, and you have these uh, these mighty monuments built by the mighty Kushites. So you have these different pyramid fields, and um, let me skip through some of these, and you might see some damage to pyramids. Don't think that the stones just fell apart because of age. Nope, these are thousands of years old, but they didn't fall apart because of age. They fell apart because uh, people were in there looking for treasures and keepsakes and gold. And here, if you're actually looking at this image that I'm showing of the pyramids of Jebel Barkel. Now remember, these are Kushite pyramids in Sudan, hundreds. And here's another site. So this is the third site we're showing you, Jebel Barkel. And if you take a look at this, take a look at the car. There's a car I'm showing in the background. That's a road. There's no gate. There's no security. There's nothing preventing anybody to go from the road to these pyramids. You would never find that really with a high level, highly respected uh, archeological site. It would be fence around it or a ticket booth. There'll be guards to make sure that the sacred artifacts are protected. But with Kush, they're not. People can go and do anything they wanna do, unfortunately. And uh, that's what it is, because it's just uh, not a lot of focus on protecting and promoting the antiquity of ancient Kush. And so uh, you got the place of Mero. Um, and uh, let me skip through this here. And um, and then there's a so-called so -called, uh, pyramids of Mero. They're not actually in Mero. Mero is the capital city, but where they were, were smelting and distributing, it was an iron distribution uh, center. But the pyramids are at a place called Bagrawea. Bagrawea is really the name of the site, not Mero. So if somebody writes the pyramids of Mero, they really mean Bagawea uh, more than anything else. And there's pyramids that are scattered in the area. It was a rich archaeological area. And Bagawea is uh, the, the pyramid site. So this is always a special place to go to. There's a new visitor center that's there. They've done a really good job of that, uh, the new visitor center to go in and learn about the, uh, the local region, you know, uh, with all of the different pyramids. It is spectacular. But these are the ones that you might often see. And, uh, but then again, so it's the fourth pyramid site. So do El Kuru, uh, Nuri, Gebel Barkel. Now these are Bagawea. So there's at least four major pyramid sites or pyramid centers in the area. Here's me, I was at the site, very hot there in the desert folks, uh, very hot, but it's rewarding when you actually go. And um, to skip through some of this. So you have the pyramids and then in front of the pyramids of Bagawea near the, 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 the capital center of Mayro, that which could have had maybe 20 to 25,000 inhabitants, is um, you have these pyramids and then in front of each pyramid was a chapel right in front of them. And if you see lighter colors at these sites, it simply means that they've been renovated or rebuilt. That's the lighter uh, color, but the darker color is usually the original stone. So again, these are thousands of years old. These are Kushite pyramids in, um, in the area. Now let's take a look at why some of the pyramids are missing their tops and missing stones because of uh, Giuseppe Ferlini. Ferlini in the 1830s, you got an infamous, not famous, an infamous Italian explorer that went in, literally, there's a picture of him I'm showing, and he destroyed over 40 pyramids in Bagawea and in Sudan in general in an in a unprecedented search for treasures. That's why a lot of these, um, these pyramids are damaged and destroyed. It's because of one man who went in, who was like a destructive tornado. He went in just as destructive as they come. And Fernlini went in there looking for treasure and went one by one to destroy pyramids and his search for gold and his search for treasures. So there's a picture, you look at Bagawea and one by one, the tops are missing, looking for gold, looking for treasure, looking for keepsakes. Can you imagine? You got mighty monuments that were built to last for eternity that were in pristine shape 
for thousands of years. And then suddenly a man comes from Italy in the 1830s, knocking off cops one by one in the, uh, in the area. And this is why did you find the damage here. This is the work of Ferlini, damaging monuments, looking for gold. One place that in all the angles you look at it, Bagawir, is the destructive influence and the telltale sign of Ferlini knocking off tops everywhere in the region. And that's what you find. One angle after another, the man destroyed. And, uh, and that's, you know, and uh, let me show you here. Um, I'm going to show you another image, but um, I'm going to end and see if there might be some questions because uh, uh, one thing about it is that Trellini, you know, some of these images, they've been taken in museum, I mean, the treasures and so forth, but uh, it's just his work. You know, and one thing that I, I'll add here, and we'll discuss this in a very, uh, another program, is the uh, the female rulers. You have a whole line of Kadaki queens and um, very powerful, and uh, they represent a powerful tradition of female rulership. Not only queen mothers, but queens and special titles as, as spiritual leaders and priestesses. This is a Kushite tradition. And the role of the women was completely different in classical Africa than it was, let's say, in Europe. Women had the highest status. They represented the throne. And queenship, you see it throughout the region, literally. Throughout the region, you have high-level female authority, political authority, religious authority, and you see it everywhere. And that's why when you go to places like Naga, you've got Aminatori uh, here knocking enemies over the head. And this is an image you see very commonly in the entire region. And I wanted to show Aminatori because her pyramid here uh, at Bagrawea near Mayro, uh, this is it. And uh, Ferlini, you know, went in and he's destructive there as he was everywhere. But it's this man, Ferlini, the same guy who goes in and um, he takes the jury of... Um, Amanashi Kato, who's one of the female rulers of Kush. Here's an image in, the, in 1822 before uh, Fellini goes in in the 1830s looking for gold, looking for keepsake. And uh, he took and stole gold. So Amanashi Kato, this is the only one of the pyramids where he found any gold or treasure or keepsake. He's destroyed over 40, and only in one does he find the jewelry. I mean, just absolutely disrespectful and destructive. One man can come in and go through all these different uh, pyramids looking for gold and keepsakes. He finds jewelry in one. And um, anyway, uh, the role of women, we'll discuss that on another program. And um, to so that's, um, that's what I'm going to share right now as we kind of wind down and see if there might be anybody that has a... Uh, some questions. So if you so right now you're listening to African studies with Professor Mainu and Pim. And I've been just showing you some of the slides about the classical civilizations of ancient Kush. And then next week we'll actually look um, a little bit more at the the women, and um, and then we'll look at the modern cultures in the area today that represent the extension and the continuation of the cultural practices of ancient. Kush and the regional practices that are still operative today, the languages, the, the practices, the traditions, you see a lot of that that's still taking place even as we um, as we speak. Now, you listen, if, if you're listening in on uh, SYP St. Kofa Radio, you can call in at 205-730-1400. That's 205-730-1400. If you uh, want to weigh in, you have a question, then uh, you can call in. You know, we have a few minutes left. And um, I know some of you are watching us as well on Facebook. So if you are watching us on, uh, on Facebook, maybe you might have a question. But there's nothing more important than Kush, so keep something in mind. What people are dealing with and looking at is they are looking at Kush in reverse, they see the more the more recent period in Kush, and not the the most ancient, because what we're looking at of, of Kush is the more modern 
part, but we got to go deeper. Going deeper meaning what? There's got to be archaeological work to look at the original foundation of Kush, and also going deeper, we actually mean this. We mean the uh, going to do the oral history. So that's what I'm going to be able to do or, or will do uh, in the next program or so. We'll look at the field work among the indigenous cultures, and I'm sure you will be very intrigued to see the remnants and the continuing aspects, cultural aspects of Kush. So people are misled. They think Kush uh, has to do the young brothers and sisters, marijuana. No, nope, we're not talking about that kind of Kush. Then we got other people who are interested in the civilization of Kush. They're following uh, some misleading writer from a hundred years ago, rather than the real ancient Kush, which is what we've been really talking about today. And that's why I'm in pursuit. And you'll be very surprised to know how the indigenous cultures and villages that I travel to, when people are, are um, they know the name Kush is not anything new to them. They know Kush, they know they speak a Kushite language and they, they have a lot of ceremonies that they can explain in detail. And when I show them images of Kush and some of the old images from the past, they're stunned. The elders are very stunned because they hadn't seen any of these images before. And I show images, ceremonies, and rituals that are very similar to the same rituals that they continue to do. And even though they may not know about the uh, the past, they um, they do know about their current practices. Um, you know, dealing with with their rituals and ceremony, and they know they're connected to Kush. So there's so much work to be done as we continue to move forward, but there's nothing more important than Kush. Kush is the most ancient of the civilizations, and we have to know that. If we don't, then uh, that's why people need to understand the importance and the value and the power of Kushology, the study of ancient Kush. We hear about Egyptology. Well, that's the, that's the mainstream misinterpretation of, um, of, of the civilization of Kemet. So we're not, we're not uh, Egyptologists. We're, Kush, we're uh, Kemetologists, the study of ancient Kemet from an inside point of view. And then the field of Nubia emerged with the building of the Aswan Dam, which flooded a, uh, a, a significant region of Nubia. So, you know, now people use Nubiologists, but even more distant to that is the emerging field of Kushology. That's what has to be done if we're really gonna have any real knowledge of, um, of uh, ancient Kushite civilizations. So look at ancient Kush from the record the linguistic record, archaeological record, or history record, and really put all of the evidence together and to be able to, to, uh, to compile the most complete record on ancient Kush from the field. And there are people in the field that are so excited because they know about Kush, they know their culture. And when researchers come in, they just come in and they go and they leave as opposed to uh, staying among the indigenous people to learn, to be humble. And what I'm told a lot of times, people will come in, phony film crews would come in for a day or two. They, uh, <laughs> this is absurd. And then they do some, a couple of superficial uh, interviews. They do some, take some film, film footage and then suddenly they put together a highly spectacular film. And then this becomes uh, some kind of accurate portrayal of the region as opposed to staying in the area and respecting the people and the rituals and the ceremonies and the elders and the chiefs and the kings and really observing the culture to, to observe and absorb and to learn. This is why I had shared with uh, folks that that's why I get respect when I'm in the field because the people respect a brother that comes in, not representing the government, not representing some Western foundation, that wants to make money uh, at the expense of the people, but coming in to do what? To respect the people, to learn from them, and to amplify and promote their culture that goes back to the distant past. So this is why Kush is important. So what we will do next week is delve more deeply into Kush. This was just an introduction of Kush. So on Africana Studies, with Professor Mainu M. Pim. You all can continue to listen on WSYP radio, but join me live on Facebook and we'll show more images, more details about
push, we'll look at the female rulers, but also the field work that I've been doing, and you'll see some of the uh, paraphernalia people use and the rituals and ceremonies that directly link the people to the traditions of the Nile Valley. And you know that when you're looking at temple walls, two walls, you can see the people today are the ones that that represents. So um, please join us next week, next time, and stay tuned to Africana Studies with Professor May Nguyen Pim. We'll be coming back to you live and uh, we will deal with the second installment of the classical African civilizations of, uh, of ancient Kush. So uh, that's our program for today. And we'll be back in the saddle next week. So we'll see you next Sunday coming to you live on the radio and Facebook Live. Over and out.